especially in Europe, we tend to have big collaborations because we have relatively few facilities. Although I'm sure I'm going to uh, chat with, um, with Cameron about whether or not his lovely facility could also be used for this kind of work as well. Um, and, uh, and so I thought I'd introduce, first of all, it's all important to always recognize the people who we worked with. Um, and here's a, a list broadly brought broken into two groups, the group who helped us with the novel based laser based sources. So that's uh, our group at York, plus um, Imperial College, the Central Laser Facility, the University of Strathclyde, uh, University of Michigan, and also there were some collaborators at DC as well um, in this collaboration. And then the imaging was done mainly by, by us at York um, and SciTech Precision, who are a kind of target fabrication group who helped us um, with potential designs and helped us and kind of keep our ideas into something which was approximately um, believable, I guess, or, or, re or realizable, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Um, I put Livermore and Los Alamos down here as, as collaborators. At the moment, they're basically helping us understand their needs. And that's kind of the role that I would like to um, encourage NSSC members to join us in as well, at least to start with. Um, so I thought I'd put some context into what York is. I'm at the York Plasma Institute. It is, I, it's the, I believe it's the largest plasma physics group in the UK and one of the largest university-based plasma physics groups in Europe. Um, and uh, we have, um, uh, we've got three strands. We've got a magnetic confinement fusion strand, a low temperature plasma strand that concentrates on both um, industrial and medical applications of plasmas. And then we have the matter in the, the extremes group. And that is where I sit uh, on laser plasma accelerators, broadly speaking, but also um, the sources and applications of those sources. Uh, and so we have um, uh, six academics and two, uh, and two emeritus academics as well. And we do everything from high pressure materials uh, and experiments at SLAC and the European XFEL, all the way to fusion energy in collaboration with Rochester and, and, and um, other large groups, as well as, um, as lab astrophysics and, and the work that I'm going to talk about today, which is in particle accelerators and applications of laser based sources. Um, just I always like to introduce York because it's um, a place that I now call home. I've realized, hang on a second, I'm just going to pause sharing because something is happening with this. Um, it's automatically advancing, which is a little problematic. Um, let's try this again. I think I know what's happened. So, um, Okay, so uh, yeah, we're based at the University of York. We're a short walk from the city of York, which is kind of famous for being um, an old place. And this is doing it again. I'm sorry about this. Um, I'm trying to fix this, but I don't know how. Sorry, bear with me for one second. Um, Apologies about that. It turns out my PowerPoint had automatically switched on advancing, which I've never used in my life. So no idea how that happened. Um, okay, so um, yeah, we're in the University of York, which is a beautiful old city. Um, and if you ever get a chance to visit, please do and, and come and say hi. Um, we are a relatively young university. Um, we're a modern campus. Uh, founded in 1963, so relatively recently, and we're set around two man-made lakes, which is a really nice place. And we have lots of geese as well, which is comes with huge challenges when you try and cycle to work and you're faced with this, as I was uh, <laughs> during the spring, as, as all the as all the baby geese had just been, just been hatched. Um, the talk's going to be 
based around laser wakefield acceleration. So I'll start with a very brief introduction of what that is. Um, I guess from an applications perspective, um, it's less important exactly how the electrons and the x-rays are made, um, but I think it's important to sort of outline that as, as an important part of our research. I'll then talk about source generation and optimization um, and some clever ideas that we have about how to do that and some recent work that we published on that, on that topic. I'll then uh, look at two applications of um, the laser accelerated electron beams, so that strong field QED and um, Bremsstrahlung sources. I'll talk about different sources as well, um, but recognize that, that, the, that there are many different groups working on different sources and each of them have their own um, particular use. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll then look at how we can image x-rays. And this is the work that uh, is predominantly in um, Matthew's PhD thesis. Um, and then I'll uh, look at a short extension to how that might be used for neutron imaging, particularly fusion, fusion neutrons, but actually if they're lower, lower than 14 MeV, that would be even easier for us. So we can talk about how we might think of applications of our um, sort of neutron imaging that might be useful as part of a broader collaboration with, with some of you in the audience. Um, so let's look to start with actually at, yeah, and I'll, and I'll go through these one at a time. Um, so let's look at Wakefield acceleration. So this is, as most of us laser Wakefield accelerator people are bound to do, um, is a, a gratuitous video off the back of a cruise ship. <laughs> so if you look at um, the this is actually taken off the back of a cruise ship and I was looking down at the waves and just to guide the eye, I'll point out these three waves here. What you should note is that those three waves don't appear to be moving. And that means that and by corollary that they must be moving at the same speed as the ship. And that's basically the fundamentals of, um, of laser wakefield acceleration or any wakefield acceleration. In fact, wakeboarding uh, uses this, this same idea. Um, but the waves that travel along behind a ship travel at the same ship speed as the ship or the boat. Um, and what does that mean? Well, just like a surfer, um, if the um, if the surfer is sitting um, on the on the surface of the water and the wave passes underneath, the surfer will be raised up and then dropped down again by the wave as it passes, but won't necessarily gather any information from the wave. And hopefully, my um, point was visible. Um, the, the lines along the bottom here are examples of those surfers who are bobbing up and down but not being captured by the wave. Um, as the surfer starts paddling in the same direction as the wave, their, their gamma, their velocity relative to the wave goes up. And as well as um, bobbing up and down, they can then start gaining energy um, from that wave and be accelerated forward. And surprise, surprise, I'm not actually talking about surfers and waves, I'm actually talking also about lasers in plasmas. And in much the same way as when a boat travels through a still sea, you get waves traveling behind the boat at the same speed as the boat. Uh, in the same way, if a laser travels through a plasma, it can basically slosh the electrons around and generate waves in its wake. Slightly different because these are three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional waves. Um, but in much the same way, they travel at the same speed as the laser. This only works because our lasers are so short pulse, they're femtoseconds or tens of femtoseconds in duration. And on that time scale, the, the electrons have a chance to escape the laser field, but the ions do not. And as a result, you end up with a restoring force. So in much the same way as you get two-dimensional water waves where gravity is the restoring force after a boat passes, in a three-dimensional plasma, you get three-dimensional density, electron density wave, where the restoring force is the electrostatic force caused by the electrons being kicked out on the ions remaining stationary or approximately stationary. Um, and to show that uh, you get a similar effect, I'll put alongside each other, we have um, uh, uh, the video of the boat again, but this time we've got a simulation showing a laser pulse traveling through from top to bottom, and you can see the waves of electron density behind the, uh, behind the, the laser. And what you'll notice is you've got regions of incredibly high density and regions of, of low density electrons. And that means the electric field between these two regions is incredibly strong. Um, and in fact, much stronger than a conventional accelerator. 
eventually accelerators are generally limited by the fact that if you turn up the the, the fuel too high, you don't just accelerate the beam of, of electrons or particles in the accelerator, you actually accelerate the material from the side of the accelerating cavity. And so you cause breakdown to occur, you basically get arcing, you get a spark coming across the middle of your accelerator if you turn up the, the fuel too high. That spark, of course, is simply a plasma. So by using the plasma to start with, um, and we don't need to worry about any breakdown limit, so the breakdown limit does no longer no longer exists because we're using a, a plasma as the accelerating gradient as the accelerating medium for our um, for our, for our electrons. So why would you want to do this? Well, I've hinted at some of the reasons. First of all, there's no breakdown limit, which means you can have a higher field and therefore a smaller accelerator. We can have some discussion later if you want about how big the lasers are because they're not small. Um, but there is a potential at least to have a smaller accelerator. Um, the spatial scale of those electrons is um, of the order of the, um, the electron, the, the laser spot. And so if we can focus our laser to between a few and tens of microns, then we would expect the electron bunch to be smaller than tens of microns, so down to a few microns. Um, and the Temporal scale is also comparable to the laser. So if the la these waves are being produced, the, the period of those waves is usually around 30 or 40 or 50 femtoseconds, which means the bunches of electrons we can generate generally have a duration of around about um, anywhere between a few femtoseconds and 50 femtoseconds, which is generally a lot shorter than, than a conventional accelerator that you, could, that you, um, you could get without paying a lot of money for compression of beams, for example. Um, so, and also, why would you want to? Because those are cool. Um, that's, I'm only being slightly facetious here in the sense that, um, that if you can generate a, an electron bunch using a laser, then you don't just, this is going to sound really silly, you don't just have an electron bunch, you have an electron bunch in the same chamber as a laser. And if you want to do any interaction physics between those electron bunches and the laser, then producing the electron bunches with a laser means not only is it in the same place, it's also at the same time. And I mean that literally, that you can then overlap an electron beam and a laser to within a few femtoseconds, because the generation of the electron beam is driven by the, gen by the laser pulse. And so now you can have a, a laser electron interaction that would be much more difficult to do if the electrons were generated by a conventional source. So there's a few of the, of the reasons why you might want to use a, a laser weight field accelerator. Um, and I used to have a, I used to have a slide up here about um, the famous Einstein quote about, you know, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, you'll think it's an idiot for the rest of its life or something like this. I've since found out that that, that probably wasn't Einstein who said that at all. So I've, I've tried to stop using that. But the point still applies that um, I'm not one of these people who's going to stand up and say, you know, stop funding Fermilab. You know, you can you can put down you can put down all your all your conventional accelerators. We've got this one done, right? We've fixed the problem. We are going to make cheap and compact accelerators. That's just not true, um, at least not yet. I mean, there may be someday in the future when that's a possibility, but you won't catch me telling people that that conventional accelerators don't have a place. Uh, my big take on this is: well, what can we do differently? What can we do better without? Um, uh, and what new? avenues of research can we open by our accelerators which have unique capabilities um, and so the things that we've already spoken about acceleration means maybe it's portable uh, a short bunch duration uh, means that you can do strobing by that i mean um like you, you can you can freeze frame a, a physical process uh, by using a, a short bunch of radiation or a short bunch of electrons if you want to do electron diffraction or something like that um, the high peak charge, um, we get, although we only get probably a, a pico or maybe up to a nanocoulomb or a few nanocoulombs of charge in the electron bunch, it does come in a few femtoseconds, which means the peak current is kiloamps. Um, and kiloamps are very difficult to achieve um, by other processes. Um, so one could imagine doing multi photon processes or utilizing that to reduce the acquisition time of, uh, of a signal. Um, and the other one 
which I kind of hinted to again with the with the silly um, Toy Story slide is is that it's got a home team advantage. If you want to do a laser electron interaction, then it may be advantageous to use a uh, laser based electron beam rather than rather than anything else. And actually, that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to show an application of laser Wakefield acceleration, which utilizes uh, this home team advantage. And then I'll do another application, which is looking at radiation sources, which kind of touches on these other three options. In order to use them at all, it'd be really useful if we could optimize the parameters of that electron beam as we generate it. So um, here's an experiment that we conducted a while ago. This is an, a diagram of the experiment, but it, this slide could equally apply to any, any setup at all. We focus the the, the laser onto some plasma source, either a gas jet or a gas cell most uh, normally, or, or sometimes a capillary as well. And then we extract the laser out of the way and leave only the electron beam that's generated in this plasma source. Uh, and it comes through um, and we can analyze it by um, sweeping the electrons with the dipole magnet. And of course, then the position is correlated to the energy of the electrons. And we can use a, a scintillation screen to measure the energy of the electrons in the beam. Um, we also, in this case, we put an X-ray camera so that we could see whether or not there's any X-rays being generated by the electrons and use them for some kind of radiography, perhaps. Um, we can produce all sorts of different electron beams. Um, actually, famously at, at, at LBNL, they, they produced some incredibly high energy GEV electron beams. They were the first in the world to do that. Um, and, the, uh, and sometimes they can be very non-Maxwellian. Um, some might say quasi-monoenergetic. Um, I'm always a little careful about that since I started working at Exfels, um, where monoenergetic means sort of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 bandwidth. Um, when we talk about non-Maxwellian beams, they're quasi-monoenergetic in a few percent. Um, is, is a reasonable expectation for most weak field accelerators, possibly better with some, with some interesting um, additional um, techniques applied to a sort of standard weak field accelerator. Um, we can produce high charge broadband beams. So every energy from zero up to, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 MeV is, is perfectly possible. And, and generally, if we don't care so much about the spectrum, we can do more in terms of charge. And um, we could do a high repetition rate. We, there are laser accelerators working at 10 Hertz at the moment, um, and that's good. But to do that, we tend to have a lower spec, a lower power, laser system in operation and as a result the high repetition rate usually comes at the expense of the of the GEV scale uh, electron beams and it's possible to get low divergence but again that usually comes at the expense of something else and so um, we usually can't get all of these at the same time although of course there's work being done to try and optimize each of these individually and each of these in pairs and as a and in trios and and as, and as a quartet. Um, in principle, because we can produce all these different types of beams, it would be possible to optimize the beam. The problem is it requires the choice of laser and plasma parameters. And when I say plasma parameters, I'm mainly talking the, the length of the gas cell, so whether it's half a millimeter or, or several centimeters. Uh, and the, the other big plasma parameter we have to care about is the density. Although equally, you can introduce um, density ramps and different shapes of density within that gas uh, that plasma plasma source. So there's a few parameters that we have in uh, parameters we have in the plasma. In terms of the laser, there are many more parameters. So laser energy, kind of obvious, I guess. And um, focal spot size is one. Pulse duration is another. But as well as those three, we've also got things like spectral phase. So um, the exact shape of that laser pulse is not. I would say not always Gaussian. In fact, very rarely you would find a short pulse laser that's precisely Gaussian. And you can control different aspects of the shape of that laser pulse by controlling what we call the first, second, third, and fourth order phase. And we do this with a, with a bit of um, kit at the front end, which I think is a, a spectral phase modulator or a dazzler is the kind of, the, the sort of brand name for it. So if we've got four, five, six different parameters in the laser, and we've got one, two, or three different parameters in the plasma, we now find ourselves with a, with a six-dimensional parameter space, at least, in order to search, in order to optimize the beams for a particular need. Um, and if you want to do a scan, say you want to do 10, uh, 
10 possessions in every position, and we want to do a full grid search of this six dimensional space, even if we only have 10 different positions. And that's a relatively small or a relatively, relatively small range or a relatively coarse grid we'll find that we need something of the order of a million different shots. And a million laser shots, especially if we're looking at one of the higher end, uh, higher power laser systems, which shoot maybe one, one hertz, we're now talking about a significant amount of time in order to optimize the electron beam before even using it for an application. So the link between the high dimensionality of the parameter space uh, and the, amount of the, the shot rate of the laser and then the amount of time it takes to actually find the beam that you want to use is a, is um, could potentially be a continuing problem in laser weak field acceleration, particularly if you want your laser accelerator to be multimodal. So if you want to set up a beam to do a job, that's great. If you want to set up a beam to have a laser and plasma, laser plasma accelerator to have multiple applications, then we really need to be careful about how we relate the um, how we understand the, the six dimensional space. And one way that we can do this, and one way that we, we tried recently, um, is to um, utilize Bayesian optimization. So we, um, we use what I call a low power, high power laser system, which is uh, the Gemini T2 system. So Gemini is a laser system that's uh, run by STFC at the Royal Alfred Appleton Laboratory in, uh, in Oxfordshire, just near, near Oxford in the south of England. Um, and at that lab, that's where the central laser facility is. They've got multiple laser systems. They have the Gemini laser system, which is two beams about close to half a, half a petawatt each. They also have a sort of front end system, which is significantly lower power. And instead of shooting once every 20 seconds, the Gemini T2 system can operate at five hertz. And so that was the system that we chose in order to try and find out something about how we could optimize this six dimensional space. Uh, we used Bayesian optimization, um, and I can talk a little bit more about that if, if anybody's interested in how we did this, um, in order to request a beam parameter. And the two examples that I'm showing here uh, in the top image um, are just to confirm that we, uh, in this system, the images I'm going to show are going to look like this electron spectrum in the bottom here. What you can read from this is that the electron beam has traveled through a magnetic field and deflected onto this onto this uh, scintillating screen. So what you're seeing is this is a broad energy spread, but a fairly narrow divergence beam that you're seeing in that electron spectrum there. So in this case, you can see the top ones look terrible, but it turns out they've got a high charge, an awful lot of charge in them. And the bottom beams are relatively narrow. Um, and actually both of these are a set of beams that were optimized using a uh, Bayesian optimization routine. And uh, for the beam charge, for example, we optimized over 35 bursts. Each of those bursts was 50 shots, um, which took around 10, uh, yeah, about 10 seconds each. And so um, in fact, I think this is over, I, th I think we did, we did 50 seconds each. So we, we shot a lower rep rate, mainly because the, the vacuum chamber took some time to recover. Um, we're talking about something like half an hour of shooting in order to optimize um, some parameter, in this case, beam charge, um, using a, a, a Bayesian optimization routine. And the reason that this was particularly interesting is two things. First of all, it turns out that the optimal uh, laser pulse um, was only one femtosecond longer than the, the shortest possible pulse that was available by, uh, from the system. This means that there's certain um, intricacies going on with the phase of the laser that we don't necessarily understand or, or it's not necessarily obvious immediately, um, but play an important role in optimizing um, the electron beam for particular applications. Um, and if we took, instead of looking at all six, uh, we're well, looking at the phase space for all the plasma and laser parameters. If we just look at two of the laser parameters, this is a, a, an image from that paper which looks at the second order and the fourth order um, uh, spectral phase of the laser. Now, I, I'm not going to really explain what these are, and that's that's not so important. It's really, the idea is that in theory, 
to find the optimum position in this two-dimensional phase space, the, the sort of normal way that we would have done this previously would be to do a scan in one di direction, find the optimum, and then scan in the other direction. So this, you can think of this as a, as a two-dimensional scan. Um, and uh, we started at position A, marked an A in this diagram, and, we did, and if we were doing it by this grid scan, we would have done a, a grid scan along in different beta two values, we would find the optimum, which would appear round about position C. We would then scan in the beta four position, which would um, bring us to the optimum position of C. It turns out that with the um, Bayesian optimization, which basically means you, you pick different parts of phase space, you take that information and you try and uh, decipher a six dimensional um, surface uh, and look for where the, the optimum position might be for a particular parameter, in this case, uh, the charge of the electron. What we find is that the Bayesian optimization found position B as the optimum and actually managed to plot this surface showing where the charge is likely to be highest. And that position wouldn't have necessarily been found um, along by simply scanning along both um, the B beta two in the beta four directions. Um, if we wanted to scan a six dimension, a four dimensional search, and we had 11 positions per parameter, which is what we'd, roughly what we'd do normally, we'd, it would take something like 14,000 laser shots in order to do that, which is way more than it required um, by opening, uh, by using Bayesian optimization. Um, so not only can it find an optimum that wouldn't be available or wouldn't necessarily be found by two one dimensional scans, it stops, it prevents us having to do um, a full grid search of, of the parameter space. Um, and that means that we then have the option of, of trying to use these um, use these beams for something, something more interesting. So I'm going to do quickly take you through two applications, um, both of which actually do not use optimized electron beams. Uh, and the point is that if we did have uh, uh, better electron beams, we would be able to do these experiments um, more efficiently and actually have better, higher quality results um, if we were able to optimize them using these optimization first. So that's going to be the next stage for, for all of these different projects. We're going to try and implement an optimization algorithm which allows us to find the optimum um, before, to, before doing the experiment. So um, I am an experimentalist and so um, if anybody's worried about the fact I've just put a slide up that's a strong field QED, don't worry, I'm a little nervous too. And I've presented this a few times and I, I don't, I, I hope no one's offended by this, but I'm going to do what I call the QED primer, uh, which is also known as an experimentalist guide to theory. Um, I don't, uh, I don't have time to talk about it in any depth and I probably don't have the ability to talk about it in any depth either. So what we're gonna do is I'll take you through very two very famous equations, which are, um, energy is mass, or E equals mc squared, and energy is uncertain over short time scales, or delta E, delta T is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So that's um, Einstein's uh, equation of, of mass energy um, equivalence and uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And what this says is if uh, energy is uncertain over short time scales, and energy is mass, then mass is uncertain over short time scales. That means that it's possible for material to, um, to become real, or, or well, not quite real, but it could become into being and then disappear so quickly that you can't detect it. And that's what this um, Feynman diagram represents. This Feynman diagram represents a, a virtual particle or a pair of virtual particles, actually. And the squiggles say that we take energy just from the vacuum, just from the fact there's an uncertainty in the energy of the universe, uh, we can make a pair. Uh, but we have to destroy that pair immediately and return the energy to the universe. Uh, I always say you can steal as much energy as you like, as long as you put it back before Heisenberg realizes it's missing, right? That's what I think of as virtual particles, and that's all they are. So, um, why is this any use? If you can't ever see the particles, what's the point in knowing that they exist? And the answer is, well, maybe you can see the particles. If a strong, if a field is, if a, if a strong enough field is applied, um, then this electron-positron pair, for example, that are currently virtual particles, you would never be able to detect these because they exist for such a short amount of time. Um, 
But if they do exist as virtual particles for a small amount of time and you apply an electric field across them, you, there's a chance that you might be able to give them enough energy such that they have the energy equivalent to their rest mass. And then they can pop out and become real. And if you've managed to inject the energy into the system during this uncertainty time, then you don't have to give the energy back anymore because you've balanced the energy by providing it via some field. Uh, maybe an electric field, maybe a gravitational field. In fact, if, it, if you deliver that energy via a gravitational field, it's basically what Hawking radiation is. It's the gravitational field and the event horizon of a black hole being so strong that these electron and positron pairs can be, can be realized from the strong field. And as a result, they then annihilate and you get 511 keV photons flying out. Anyway, um, but it doesn't have to be gravitational fields. In fact, um, yeah, the building your own black hole in a lab is not only a difficult, but rather dangerous thing to attempt. So what we do is we try and use the electric field of the laser in order to provide that energy or that, that acceleration to these virtual particles such that they be can become real. We don't have to give the energy back. Can we see it with lasers? No, our lasers are about 10 to the seven times too weak in order to see this effect. Um, so why am I describing this to you? Have I just wasted the last three minutes of your life? You're not going to get back. Well, not quite, because um, we need a high field, but in the field of a laser, pole, uh, in the field of an electron. And so if I describe, uh, I'll use this. This is the most difficult equation I'm going to use. I, there's one, there's one that's a little trickier later, but, but pretty much the most difficult equation I'm going to use, which is to say that we can define a, a quantumness parameter, uh, uh, how quantum is the situation. And we can say it is the fields um, uh, present in the laser pulse, so E plus V cross B, divided by the critical field. But not only that, we can also multiply that by a gamma, which is the Lorentz factor of the electrons. Um, which confused me for a while, because then I realized that Lorentz factor and Lorentz force were, were both in this equation and, and, and very different things. Um, so the Lorentz factor of the electrons, so the relativistic upshift that you experience, multiplied by the ratio of the fields to the Schwinger field. This means that you don't, you, if your laser pulse is 10 to the 7 times too weak, you can still get up to a decent quantum parameter by colliding that laser pulse with an electron bunch, which is an incredibly high gamma. And this is where, um, where we realize that actually this idea of a home advantage is perfect. So we just need enough of a, a, a fast electron beam and a laser pulse in the same place and we collide them with each other, which is what this experiment did. And it was published uh, in two years ago now. Um, and this was, this was the big result. This was the big result showing that we took we spent six weeks on this laser and we got four data shots. This is six weeks in a laser that fires every 20 seconds. So we should have been able, we did take thousands and thousands of shots and four of them were able to collide the beams. And that's because the laser, the, the electron beam was not um, incredibly stable or optimized for our purposes. So we've done better experiments since, but one of the things that this brought up was, how are we going to make sure that we optimize the electron beams in a way that's efficient for a low rep rate laser so that we can then take the data which allows us to perform better experiments? And that's really the story that I wanna tell with this data is um, Bayesian optimization will help lots of different applications, including things as, as um, non-applied, I guess, a strong field QED. The other one uh, that I want to mention is radiation sources. Um, I don't particularly like this diagram, but it was my old PhD student who made it, um, and I haven't got around to making another one. Uh, but basically, if you drive a, a Wakefield accelerator, there are many sources of radiation that come from it. One is called beta, uh, comes from the Betatron oscillation. So the electrons end up wiggling inside the Wakefield because they don't only experience accelerating forces, they also experience focusing forces at the same time. Um, and this is this comes out as what we call betatron radiation, but really it's it's synchrotron-like radiation from a betatron oscillation. Um, for those who are pedantic, a bit like me, uh, the second thing that can that we can do is we can collide it with another laser down here. And this is uh, a lot of the work at Bella. Uh, there's some really really lovely work being carried out at Bella, uh, where you look at inverse Compton scattering from that electron bunch. 
by colliding with the second laser, again, making use of the home advantage of a, of a laser weak field accelerated electron bunch. And the, the final one, and this is perhaps the easiest to implement, is you take the electron bunch, you slam it into a bit of metal, and you generate branched long radiation. And that's, uh, and of course, depending on which method you pick, depends on what kind of radiation sources you can generate. So I've got a couple of examples of things that you can do with this. Um, the one on the left is from a Knight paper. This was, I, I wasn't involved in this particular experiment, but it was the Imperial College Group and others who used the Betatron radiation to radiograph a, a damselfly. And you can see incredibly high levels of contrast. This is phase contrast imaging, basically. And you can see very small details of um, micron and submicron details in this. Um, the other one, this one I was involved in, is the Brenner paper from uh, PPCF in 2016, where this wasn't even a laser weak field accelerated electron bunch. This was just smacking a laser into a solid target and seeing what happened. Um, and you can see this is a radiograph of a turbo pump um, travel, uh, pumping at full, at full speed. Um, and you can see this was taken actually on a, on a scintillator detector as well. So this is a, a, a way you could rapidly get information. Um, and of course, the damselfly required KV energies because it's very thin material, uh, whereas the, the um, turbulent molecular pump requires us to have um, MEV energy photons in order that we can see a difference between what goes through and what doesn't go through. And so this is, I, th I think, a, a, good ex a good description of why the flexibility of the sources is important, but also um, the you need to know the application before you start. And that's what I'm talking about, this idea of being able to plug in your application at the start of the Wakefield Accelerator in order to get the beams that you want out. Um, I will very quickly go through this experiment. It was where we generated electron beams. Uh, again, just we basically got electron beams, we smacked them through a converter, and that allowed us to, to do some radiography of samples. Um, and in this, we also studied, we tried to understand what happens to the um, uh, the critical energy as we change the converter thickness. And um, we also looked at um, how the divergence, the flux and the critical energy change as we change different parameters like the thickness of the material, the density of the material and the Z or the atomic, the Z, I guess, the atomic number of the, of the material. And shows that actually there's some scaling laws that you can come up with. Uh, and this was published in PPCF by I shouldn't Chris Underwood and, and a bunch of others. Um, so plasma physics and laser physics can help us with input spectrum. Based on optimization, it will probably be needed if you want um, to optimize for a particular electron beam. Uh, some of the applications of that can either be a strong field QED, so very sort of, uh, fundamental physics, or even generating ranges of branch long sources. And you can optimize it for your favorite application. So if you have a favorite application, I don't know if you do, um, then please let me know and we can work out whether or not we can find the right uh, weak field accelerator for you. Um, the second part is how do you measure them? So I've said that these are incredibly advanced and novel sources, but if you can't measure them, then we can't demonstrate that they are novel. Um, and this doesn't just apply to weak field accelerated radiation sources, um, but applies in many other, many other places instead. The conventional wisdom is that you use a pinhole camera. So you basically put a small aperture in a hole, uh, the object uh, shines through the hole and generates an image in your detector. Easy to use, you get quick results. But there's an inherent trade-off between the size of the hole um, and the, uh, the, the signal strength and the um, resolution. So if you want, uh, you know, you can't get pinhole imaging through a window. You have to have a small hole because the hole has to be smaller than the required resolution of the system um, or of the order of the required resolution of the system. Um, that also means if you've got a small hole, then you're now blocking most of the x-rays or, or the light, whatever else you're blocking, and so you don't get the same flux. So there's an inherent trade-off between these two things. And there's also this problem that if you need to stop x-rays, you have to have a thick pinhole substrate. And as the thick pinhole gets thinner and longer, first of all, you can't make it. And secondly, even if you can make it, your field of view is reduced. So you end up with all sorts of problems, including resolution, including the ability to use um, hard x-rays. Coded apertures, basically, instead of having a single pinhole, you have an array of pinholes. And this projects an image onto the detector. And that means uh, the resolution is now the smallest um, object, or the smallest perforation on your coded aperture. 
which means there's no inherent uh, signal to noise trade off because instead of having a bigger hole, you have more holes and therefore you can still produce the same um, resolution, but you've got a larger flux, which is a huge advantage for low flux sources or if you want to source detect remotely. So if you want to be far away, if you want a big standoff distance, encoded apertures are a really good idea for that. But it does require post-processing. Um, what we came up with is this idea that maybe you don't need to be fully attenuating. This would then open the possibility of using coded apertures to higher, higher energy photons. Um, when you deconvolve the signal that you get in your detector in order to work out what the image looked like, um, or what the object looked like, sorry, to generate an image, you, uh, there's this effect whereby it effectively background subtracts for you. So as long as any background that's setting your detector is flat enough and therefore uniform enough, you don't tend to have as much of a problem. And so we looked at, we developed this idea known as the CASPA, which is a coded aperture, but it includes analyzing the scatter and the partial attenuation. So we don't care if some of the, the, the blocks in our coded aperture are not perfect, as long as they scatter sufficiently, in other words, scatter some angle, or they, they attenuate something. They don't have to attenuate 100%. And so I'll now show you some results where uh, Matthew ran some simulations showing that if you've got a pinhole, also this is old data, this is the stuff that was in the paper, and we've managed to get rid of this crosshair artifact just by changing the way we, we do the deconvolution. But the point is, um, if you increase the, if you decrease the attenuation of the substrate, what you'll find is that down at about 10%, the pinhole image stops being able to perform, but the coded aperture still has a relatively high signal to noise of the order of, of what, between 100 and 1800. Um, and this is because of this constant background subtracting. So if you, uh, you can have a flat background imposed on your detector and still reconstruct the image. Um, and if you have a scattering angle, so if you now say, let's assume that all the radiation goes through, uh, but some of it scatters to high angles, and if it scatters to high angles, then you still get, uh, you, you don't get a very nice pinhole image, but you still get a very nice um, uh, coded aperture image. And this works all the way down to about 4% scattering angle. Uh, for the coded aperture, but at 4% scattering angle at the pinhole, you almost, uh, you can barely see the object. And then we looked at whether this, um, uh, whether this works for extended objects, and Matt is a big fan of space invaders, so a lot of our papers include images of these space invaders. And you can see that for 511 keV photons, we can reconstruct an image uh, with, uh, with an aperture thickness of a quarter of a millimeter. Um, if you wanted full attenuation, so if you wanted to look at uh, a pinhole imager for this, you would need something of the order 18 millimeters in order to get a one of the uh, stopping power for 511 kV photons. So it really does allow us to have more compact imaging optics for that. The extension to this is to consider what happens with neutrons. And this is where we, uh, we sort of started chatting to some people at Livermore and realized that um, their apertures that they use are basically single pinhole apertures, but they've got an array of them. Um, and only a few of these ever actually point towards the implosion at any one time. So they've got a small neutron source um, that's uh, radiating towards their aperture. In order to stop their neutrons, they have a 20 centimeter thick gold substrate. I did mention to Livermore, if we were able to replace that with a few millimeter thick substrate if I could have the leftover gold, but I don't think they're interested in that agreement. So, um, but still the, the problems, problem remains that this is a, a, a very thick, very expensive and very unwieldy um, imager that they use. Um, and so we looked at whether or not it was possible to do this instead of 20 centimeter thick gold, if we use our CASPA idea and see if it applies to the neutrons. So, <clears throat> Um, basically, uh, I'll, I'll, I won't, I'll, I'll skip through that just a little bit. It turns out that, yeah, basically, as if we have, uh, instead of having a, a 20 centimeter thick um, gold aperture, um, we can do this with about a 200 micron, no, that's not right. Ah, where is it? 
Um, we can do it with a much thinner, I'll, I might get, I might get Matt to explain what he's done, but basically a few millimeter thick. So about, I think it's about between 10 and 15 millimeter thick um, gold or tungsten um, Casper allows uh, the same uh, image. Here's, uh, uh, this is all just simulation at the moment. This is using um, the Giant simulation code. And there we go, actually, it's a five millimeter thick aperture allows us to reconstruct um, the image of the neutron source rather than the 20 centimeter thick or 200 millimeter thick aperture that they're currently using. Um, we haven't quite got this right. We're still trying to work out how to use a maximum likelihood um, to determine the symmetry of, of the implosion, which is something that we're really interested in. But equally, we're looking at whether or not this could be applied to looking for um, neutron sources or looking at locations of neutron emitters um, in other applications. So um, turns out the conclusion to this a little bit about imaging X-rays and neutrons, uh, we do not require anywhere close to 100% um, attenuation in the substrate. Um, that CASP is actually now, because we don't require a thick substrate, because the substrate's thinner, we can make the hole smaller. If we make the hole smaller, we can make the resolution of the system smaller as well. So now we're really getting to the point where we're only limited by our ability to, to make, make small holes in our aperture. Um, so uh, in principle, it, we, we've shown that it works through simulation. We hope to get some time on facilities in order to, order to look at this in practice, but it also looks promising for neutron imaging as well. Um, just to show that our friends at SciTech Precision have tried to make us one of these, and this is actually an, this is a photograph of our um, coded aperture that they made for us, which is about five millimeters in diameter and with the smallest um, hole size of about 40 microns. So this would allow us to image, I think it's, it's a, um, the thickness would allow us to image several hundred kV X-rays with 40 micron resolution. Um, so we need to do maximum likelihood to get the imaging quality better. We need to, we're looking at whether or not it's possible to get spectral selectivity, but um, we'll keep that, keep our powder dry on that one in a moment. And of course, experimental verification is important as an experimentalist, it's vital in fact. So hopefully uh, during this talk, I've explained how plasma sources can be unique and they can be impactful in a range of different places. It's just a case of finding the right, um, right applications, I think, which is something we wanna do. Um, we need to be careful that measurement techniques, about which measurement techniques we use, um, we don't have to use complicated things necessarily, but we have to make sure we understand the diagnosis as well as the generation. We don't want to be selling our um, applications and um, overselling our applications um, because actually it's measuring these things can be pretty complicated. And uh, the actually really interesting and big applications can come from relatively um, small ideas or actually a group of people getting together and discussing what stuff we do, what stuff you do, and where it might be nice to use. So um, before I stop for questions, we have been approved for this funding, which would allow it which brings us to at least the Bay Area, because we've got several people that we'd, we'd be able to visit and discuss these ideas with in the Bay Area. Um, in June or July, if anybody else is interested, then we can look at asking um, for a little more funding in order to extend that to a different location as well. It really, um, the visit would mainly just be to um, solidify the collaboration as it grows. I'd be happy to do this by Zoom as well. Um, but please contact me either by dropping me an email, chris.murphy at york.ec.uk, or um, ask the questions now. I, we can take email addresses, we can switch email addresses and start, start understanding a little bit more about how we might be able to use either the X-ray sources, X-ray or, or neutron imaging in order to sort of develop um, something which might be useful for, for the research that you're doing already. So that's me pretty much done. There's some references there. There's um, my email address on that one too, and a picture of a, of a space invader, because that's what we do. I hope that was quite clear. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Please join me in um, thanking Chris for this excellent presentation. Yes, thank you, Dr. Murphy. We really appreciate you taking the time to run through this with us. So I'll kick us off with Ooh, some questions. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, so. Oh, oh sorry, my bad. I, <laughs> it's okay, I've got it now. 
So okay. I'm send off for some reason. Okay, great. I know we only have a few minutes left, so I wanted to um, ask a question about potential applications for nuclear security and proliferation detection. So you mentioned the neutron imaging work, and I think there's a, a connection there. Can you build that out? Yeah. So, um, so what we've done at the moment is we're looking. We initially started this to look at. Um, micron scale MEV sources, which there isn't really a solution for at the moment, and for MEV X-ray sources. Um, then we realized that actually, if you're worried about not having a thick enough aperture for a pinhole, you might be able to do it with a, with a coded aperture. And then it depends on what spatial scale you need. Um, you could imagine building effectively what looks like Lego bricks of, um, of tungsten. And if you wanted centimeter scale resolution, you can imagine doing that with a passive detector with pretty thick substrates. Um, but it wouldn't be, have to be as thick as people think it might be. Um, so, but we could do the modeling for that and work out whether or not there is, um, there's any ability to do that. Thanks, Bob. Just feel Bob's leaning. Um, <clears throat> does that make sense? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if someone wants to jump in. So, I thanks for your talk. I noticed you compared the CASPA technique to the pinhole technique. I didn't know if you had also had a chance to compare it to kind of regular coded aperture techniques as well. I'm curious about it. To be honest, it is a regular coded aperture technique. It doesn't actually introduce anything more significant than that. Um, what it recognizes is that I think people have been afraid of using coded apertures because for, for high energy x-rays and neutrons because they've done the calculation of how thick the aperture would need to be. And making a hole through something that's 20 centimeters thick sounds easy, but making you know 10 to the four holes through something that's 20, meter, 20 centimeters thick is almost impossible. Um, so they didn't bother. But the point is that you don't actually need to have as thick a substrate as one might suspect. That actually, if you if you do the modeling, you can show that actually a, a few millimeters thick would probably do. And okay, I can't I can't make micron scale holes in something that's five millimeters thick, but there's it becomes a little bit more reasonable to expect that one might be able to rather than a 20, 20 centimeter thick substrate. Okay. I would have guessed before that something like five percent transmission was was acceptable, but I think you're suggesting it should be, it could be a lot different than that. Yeah, so we got to about 91% transmission and we can still reconstruct the image. So okay. you only need about, I think that's right. Is that right? I'm looking for a nod from Matthew. I think it's about 9% transmission is acceptable. Okay. Oh, sorry, 9%, sorry, yeah. And you're saying the reconstruction techniques are still standard though? Yeah, yep, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, thank you again so much, um, Dr. Murphy, and thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Um, if we are going to have additional programming, so you can find information about that on our website, nssc.berkeley.edu, and um, appreciate you all coming. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for hosting me. Thanks right. for your attention as well. It's been great. Bye.